In a world of harsh extremes, wildlife cameraman Andreas Keeling sets out to film some of the rarest, most elusive, most misunderstood animals on Earth, from snow-capped mountains to sun-baked deserts, into jungles, forests, and wave-tossed waters. Keeling is in rugged pursuit of the world's wildest encounters. The freezing waters to the west of Alaska. This is summer. It feels like winter. Here, the Bering Sea collides with the northern Pacific in a stormy battle of wills. And here, Andreas Keeling navigates his boat, the TARDIS, through the dangerous straits between the Aleutian Islands. He sails to the home of the giant grizzlies. For 10 years, he has come to film them, now he has five weeks to get reacquainted before the storm season begins and the weather really turns bad. I'm going to try to get into this fjord. I'll be protected when I get into the bay. Finding a quiet anchorage in this remote sea is crucial. If something goes wrong, no one can help him. This island, Unimak, lies off the tip of the Alaska Peninsula. It's the largest of the Aleutian Islands. And home to the second largest land omnivores on Earth, coastal brown bears, more notoriously known as grizzlies. Normally solitary, grizzlies converge under the right conditions. Here and now, conditions are right. It's summertime, and the salmon have returned to spawn. When the tide goes out, the bears get to work, rummaging through the almost dry inlets for the fatty fish. Distracted, they allow Andreas to move in close. They probably remember him or his scent. This marks his fifth visit to these far-flung beaches. But Andreas has another reason to feel safe. Humans are not usually on the bear's menu. As long as he doesn't get between them and their fish, he'll stay practically invisible. It's fine for them to be so close to me. In all the years I've been filming here, I've never been attacked by a bear. The bears make the fishing look easy, but it takes a sharp eye and quick reflexes. As the salmon race up river towards their spawning grounds, the bears manage to catch just a tiny percentage of them. In shallow water, the bears try to squash the salmon against the gravel. In deep water, the bears have a tougher time. Andreas has seen some bears catch 50 salmon a day. The clumsier ones manage only about 10. The brimming pools of salmon provoke some not-so-friendly competition. These two females aren't fighting over the fish, but over the right to use this prime fishing spot. For now, it looks like a draw, but tempers still run hot. Andreas has to watch out as he moves in close to the bears. Anger and hunger can make them unpredictable. But that's not all. The dark bear is pregnant, and the bigger, paler one has her chubby cub lagging behind. So the matrons have more than their own bellies to think about. The two-year-old cub has one summer left with his mother. He'll hibernate with her this winter, and then he's on his own. But for now, mother and son join forces. They make a formidable team against their pregnant challenger.
While she retreats, the pair fortifies itself for the next round. And Andreas catches his breath after that wild encounter. That was pretty hot. They were pretty close. I just hope they don't confuse me with a bear. Looks like the pregnant bear has had enough. She'll have to find another fishing hole. Andreas struggles over the rocky stream to witness salmon fishing at its finest. The locals call it Bear Creek, and for good reason. About one kilometer upriver, the bears slowly gather at a waterfall. They carefully stake out their position at the falls and then protect their spot. These silvery fish, known as chum salmon or dog salmon, swim and leap upstream from the Gulf of Alaska to spawn in the calm headwaters. The ones that make it will lay 2,400 eggs or more. The bears seem to know exactly when the salmon will leap. Fishing is serious business, and each catch is a prize. Too good to share even with the cubs. But this cub will be okay. He's two and a half years old and a lot stronger than he looks. He can fend for himself. When Andreas treks back to the TARDIS, he's shocked to find the boat jammed between the rocks, a victim of the changing tide. Expecting the worst, Andreas packs an emergency bag and prepares to abandon ship. If the worst comes to the worst, the trip is over. When the tide finally rises, Andreas has a window of only 10 minutes to nudge TARDIS off the rocks. With that crisis solved, Andreas spends the night planning the last few days of his trip. He wants to capture something very special before he leaves. No one has ever filmed a wild grizzly hunting underwater. He wants to do it. These waters hold plenty of food for any bear with initiative. Thick fur insulates against the icy waters. Andreas must rely on a wetsuit. On land, Andreas has calmly approached this grizzly for several days, building trust. But underwater, with his gear, that's a new situation. The grizzly acts cautious at first, but then goes about his business, deciding Andreas isn't a threat. The bear looks for salmon that died of exertion or after egg laying. The cold water keeps the meat fresh and tasty. Back at the creek, the fishing contest continues. With fewer salmon around, the grizzlies get more territorial than ever. One male even challenges Andreas. Or not. 
I think he just didn't see me. Hey, I'm here. There are so many bears here. It's incredible. The mothers bring their cubs with them. It looks idyllic, but actually it's very dangerous. As the mother chases after food or other bears, the cubs get neglected. The little ones can't keep up. Alone, they're completely vulnerable, easy prey for a marauding male bear bent on killing cubs. While the cubs watch uneasily, their mother picks a fight with a larger female. As always, the dominant bear wins the right to the fishing hole. Grizzlies have no natural enemies and can live up to 25 years. Yet as many as 50% of the cubs won't live past five, killed by their own kin or by starvation, accidents or disease. As the cold northern summer day gives way to the even colder summer night, Andreas leaves his bears and heads for one of the hottest, driest landscapes on Earth, on a quest for the giant crocodile. Andreas has come to Australia's Northern Territory, looking for one of the largest reptiles on Earth, the Australian saltwater crocodile. On the way, a bushfire. For nature, it's a kind of opportunity. Fire stick burning is the name of this type of fire. Mostly they are human made, and only the dry grass burns down. And after a couple of weeks, the fresh green grass comes up. So it's a nature process. But in the meantime, the blaze evicts thousands of small animals. The predators above await their feast. Australia's punishing heat has inspired some impressive architectural achievements, like these giant cooling towers built by some of the smallest residents of the bush. Termite mounds. They are the biggest buildings ever made by insects. And this one, it's a real giant. I think he is higher than six yards and about 1,000 years old. That's the biggest I ever saw. This unusual rock formation, sculpted by wind or water, separates the dry bush from the wet mangrove swamps and rainforests to the north, where the crocs live. In this amazing place, nature, art, and human history converge. Some of this rock painting is older than 20,000 years. So, and the style is very special. It's called the X-ray style. The Aborigines painted these animals from the inside out, showing their skeletons and internal organs. No one knows why. The rocks depict fish and lizards, but no paintings of the animal Andreas has come to see, the saltwater crocodile. The dry season from May to September has shrunk much of the Mary River into a marshy swamp, making it easier to spot the crocs. At this time of year, the temperature grows a little cooler and the crocodiles begin to slow down. The river becomes the gathering spot for the local animals, both predators and prey. Saltwater crocodiles have a fierce reputation as the most aggressive species of crocs. Andreas switches off the engine so he can approach quietly. Apparently not quietly enough. This five-meter crocodile resents the intrusion. Saltwater crocodiles fear humans and will usually flee. The next day, it seems as if all the crocodiles have fled.
But when a small crocodile splashes away, it may mean something. Yes, the crocodile has gone. All the older crocs here on the Mary River have very well established territories. And of course, they defend them against interlopers. One problem this year was that the rainy season was so bad and the river rose so high that many crocodile nests have simply been flooded. Let's see if the eggs are still in here. Oh, what's that? It was just a little fish, and I thought it was a crocodile. I'm going to go downstream. The river's a little wider there. Andreas finds an impressive specimen lounging on the bank. This is what he's come for. Now he doesn't want to scare it off. We've gone aground. He's a big one. The uneasy croc slips into the shelter of the river. But Andreas won't give up so easily. Normally, crocodiles in the whole world, they don't trust people too much. Especially if they stay on land and we are on water, it's a different thing. So they feel much more safer in the water. I like to try how close I can come to him. Crocodiles have sharp vision, hearing and sense of smell. On land, they can feel the vibration of Andreas' footsteps. This croc, after a meal, probably wishes Andreas would go away. He doesn't want to share his food with anyone. He'll take it to go. Crocodile nest. But the hatching season is over, so there's a lot of eggs in. They have about the size from a goose egg. And interesting is, the sex of the youngs is dictated by the temperature in the nest. Around 30 degrees Celsius, only females they hatch out from the eggs. If the temperature goes up to 31 degrees, Males and females, they are born. And if the temperature goes up to 32 degrees Celsius, you will have only males. But definitely no one will hatch out from this egg. They are rotten. They are really bad. It's a huge crocodile bull right in front of me. It's really a big old one. He could be 80 years old and probably weighs a ton. He didn't get to live so long by being nice. The fire drives off the mosquitoes, not the crocs. Around here, the night has a thousand eyes. I'm really amazed how many 
young crocodiles I see at night here in the swamps. In the daytime you see maybe one or two, but at night looks like the whole swamp is full with him. This one is very young. When they get stressed, they let out these stress cries. About 50% of them won't reach the first birthday. After a few weeks, the parents stop looking after them, and then they may just as easily eat them. See you later, Keta. It can seem like a cruel survival strategy, but it works. Crocodiles have roamed here since before the dinosaurs. Now they're protected against humans and are free to hunt at will. This looks to me like a kangaroo colony. It's unbelievable how many animals they are. Where you see kangaroos, they are almost certainly crocodiles too. A crocodile will lurk near the shore and pounce on a hapless kangaroo grazing too close to the water. On land, crocodiles may seem like lumbering, awkward beasts, but in their element, they become creatures of beauty and grace. And that's where Andreas wants to film them. Underwater. In the river, the crocodile has every advantage, and Andreas faces a greater risk. He'll have to count on the croc's naturally suspicious nature. Crocodiles need a bit of time to get used to a new kind of prey. They get used to one species at a time. Wallabies, fish, wild pigs, dingoes. And in that sense, I'm something quite new for them. They need a bit of time before they can identify me as prey. I want to use that time to film the crocodile. As long as Andreas doesn't overstay his welcome, he can enjoy this brief but wild encounter. In time, a suspicious crocodile will revert to full predator mode. But in the mountains of Asia, hides a creature so timid, it's difficult to get within a mile of it. A challenge Andreas can't resist. North of the Himalayas in the Tian Shan Mountains of Kyrgyzstan, Andreas has come here not for the yaks, but to find the biggest sheep in the world, the notoriously elusive Marco Polo Argali. After two days in a Russian army truck, Andreas comes across his first Argali at a nomad encampment. This one's a lamb and fully domesticated. Not exactly what he had in mind. They hunt the Marco Polo Argali here, and this one is an orphan. They found him as a newborn in the spring, so he's only four or five months old. They bottle fed him, and you can see how incredibly tame he's become. Wild Argali are notoriously timid, and to find them, Andreas must head deep into the mountains. But he doesn't get far before the truck breaks down. He leaves it behind, grabs his equipment, and makes his first excursion into the field. This is tough territory, and the thin, cold air doesn't make it any easier. It's cold, and my water bottle is frozen solid. We are almost at 4,000 meters here, and it's November. My toothpaste is frozen too. Have to sort it out. 
today started well. Andreas refuses to let the harsh conditions restrict his morning routine. I think once is enough. When the great Italian explorer Marco Polo came through here in the 13th century, he described seeing gigantic sheep's horns. It was said the people used them to make fences to protect their livestock. Andreas finds an Argali skeleton. No telling how long it lay here in the cold. But the bones show that Marco Polo didn't exaggerate about the Argali. The road ends here, so Andreas needs a horse. Throughout Central Asia, regular horse markets form the center of business and social life. This horse is more than four years old. He's trying to cheat me. We are going to need a lot of these up in the mountains going up and down the rocky slopes. These hills look gentle, but don't be fooled. The team is already about 4,000 meters up and climbing into thin air. The going gets tougher. For a newcomer like Andreas, and even for his experienced guides, Onur and Tama, after two days, they spot a herd of Marco Polo Argali across the border in China. Not always on the friendliest terms with Kyrgyzstan. Probably no one would notice if the team crossed, but they can't take that chance. Instead, they catch their breath and change some horseshoes. They continue their quest through a deep forested valley and fresh snow. The temperature has dropped to minus 10 Celsius. Da, da. The others have already crossed the river. Andreas proceeds carefully. One slip in the frigid waters would be miserable and possibly fatal. As the weather deteriorates, Onoa finds them shelter in a friend's yurt. Tama returns home, hoping to beat the storm. The men appreciate the warmth. And a proper meal. This is the first hot meal I've had in three weeks. It really feels good. When the weather clears, the yurt's owner, Khan, leaves with them. The wind kicks up, and the Argalis are nowhere to be seen. This is really torture for horse and rider. But then Khan gets distracted. A snow leopard tracker in Soviet times, he still can't resist following the tracks of those hard to find cats. A leopard's territory can extend to approximately 500 square kilometers. These silent cats have no fear of people, but humans rarely see them. Still no sign of the elusive Argalis. The men continue their grueling quest. We are now at almost 4,300 meters. The air is really thin here, and every step is exhausting. The camera equipment weighs so heavy on our shoulders. But there had to be a reason. The Marco Polo Agalis have never been filmed before. We are now very close to a group. The Marco Polos are just on the other side of the ridge about 200 meters away. They can't see us and they can't smell us because they are upwind of us. 
But the Argalis keep moving further away. They get nervous if they sense a person within a 500 meter radius. Andreas needs his white camouflage coat to move in closer. He has a long walk ahead of him. He can capture the sheep with his long lens, but the layers of cold and warm air distort the image. That won't do. I'm going to try climbing up after them when they've reached the peak. The wind's in my favor. Should be okay. I'm almost at the top, just another hundred meters. But I don't think I'm going to be able to get up to the Marco Polos. They've all moved on again. I think human beings don't belong up here. This is Argali country, and the mountains have always belonged to them. Andreas leaves the Argali's harsh world for his next encounter, a more hospitable place where the king of the beasts lives in exile. In Roman times, Asian lions ranged from Greece to China, but today only about 300 survive, and every one of them lives here in Gia National Park in Western India. Andreas has come to the park to see how they've adapted. This forest of acacia, fig, and teak trees spans about 1,300 square kilometers, large by human standards, but it's all that stands between the lions and extinction. Most lions don't normally live in forests. They're animals of the savanna, dividing the plains into separate territories to stay out of each other's way. But these displaced cats have learned to make do in this small protected environment. The Asian lions share the gear forest with spotted axis and sambar deer, their main prey. But the dry season makes hunting difficult. The crunch of leaves underfoot alerts the prey. Andreas has the same problem trying to film here. He gets some help from the locals. The Malhari people live right inside the national park. They give Andreas a lesson in camel cart driving and show him where to find lions. So I like to leave the cart here and the men because we are right in the center of the gear forest now and this area has the highest density on lions. It was nice to meet you. Yo. Thank you. Thank you. Nearby, a samba deer and her fawn browse in the forest, unaware of the lioness crouched and ready to attack. She's using the Malhari roads to keep quiet. But she won't make it this time. Only one in 20 attacks succeeds here. Now it's just the hungry lioness and Andreas. He knows enough about big cats to be very, very careful. But she ignores him, too focused on finding more prey and accustomed to seeing humans from the Malhari village nearby. And it's just too darned hot. I think for this morning the hunt is over and now they go in the forest and wait for the evening time. While Andreas waits for the lions, he'll find some fresh water. You always have to filter water here. It takes time, but there are just too many bacteria in it. And this is the only water anywhere around here that I can get. You never know who you're sharing your water with. Like, for example, water buffalo. 
buffalo demonstrate a family's prosperity. Milk products fetch a high price. The buffalo herd attends several families' livestock. He knows all that goes on in this section of the park. You saw a lion here? No lion. No lion. Instead, Andreas spots a sambadia taking the opportunity to grab a bite. During the dry season, it's not easy to find enough leaves to sustain itself. It will have to bide its time for two more months until the monsoon rains come, making the forest lush again. Unlike most lions, the gear lions don't hunt in prides, and the males have to catch their own prey. At most, two females might live and hunt together. Andreas reaches the Malhari village and his old friend. Ah, this is my camel. Okay. Yeah. Let's go inside. Come on. Come. The whole village is protected by a thorn bush. It's to stop the lions coming in. This is where the cows are kept at night. And the Maltaris are afraid. The lions will come at night and grab one of their calves. The villagers aren't wearing all this gold just to impress Andreas. The Maldharis are traditionally adorned with jewelry and intricate tattoos. They also have a fascination for big cats. Even so, the Maldharis don't especially like lions. They have pictures of them. Even African lions they've never seen. So, this is my bed. That's my bed. I can sleep here for the night. Thank you. The next morning, Andreas renews his quest. He gets a tip on where he can find a large dead buffalo just killed by two lions. OK, see you again. Bye bye. He hopes to catch the beasts in action. There's a the carcass. One lion guards it. He looks old and sick. He won't be the one who killed it. The lion that did kill it won't be too far away. I think I should leave. This lion's showing no reaction. And the other lion must be somewhere nearby. As Andreas moves on, he witnesses another scene that underscores the gear lion's plight. A pride of young lions and a female with a litter of newborn healthy cubs. The lion population has started to grow. Sounds like good news, but there's no more space here. India has taken Asiatic lions to other national parks they thrived, but when they began attacking local livestock, the villagers poisoned them. Gia National Park has become the only place on Earth to welcome and nurture the Asian lions, the last refuge for an entire species. Meanwhile, 5,000 kilometers away, a different species has adapted to civilization a little too well. When night falls in Romania, the beasts come out. Enormous, ravenous, and with an unsettling appetite. It's no joke for the people of Brasov in central Romania, terrorized, sometimes mutilated by brown bears. The police have tried to scare the bears away, but now they're back with a vengeance. 
Andreas Keeling wants to solve the mystery of the marauding bears. But first of all, why Brasov? Brasov is the second largest city in Romania and the only city where huge brown bears come into town. Every night, bears come from the hillsides of the Carpathis right into here, and they dig in the garbage containers. Andreas has seen plenty of bears in his career, but he's never seen them act like this before. Can he help stop them? No. 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 As the city grew, these animals adapted to live in two completely different habitats, urban and pristine countryside. Their original home in the Carpathian Mountains lies beyond the beautiful Romanian plains with some remarkable wildlife, like the great bustard, among the heaviest flying birds in Europe and Asia. As Andreas drives deeper into the countryside, he travels further back in time. The villages here haven't changed in two centuries. And neither have the forests. These dense, unmanaged woods recall the enchanted forests of old world fairy tales. What strange creatures dwell here. This dead wood is very important for the health of the forest. It can support hundreds of species, especially species of insects that no longer exist in Western Europe. Andreas knows about wild boars from his work as a forest ranger in Germany. Experience has taught him the importance of sizing up their mood and their status before getting too close. It's like with the wolves. The alpha female boar gets the first bite. Just like the alpha female wolf has the first bite at the deer. Here, the hierarchy is clear to see. I think she's intelligent enough to know I'm not a threat. But a white boar once nearly bit my finger off. That was horribly painful. And I got this scar here from a boar's tusks. But Andreas has come here for bears, not boars. He gets back to work. A forester has given Andreas a deer carcass to attract the bears. But some party crashers arrive first. And then they have second thoughts. Generations of people have learned to fear the big bad wolf, but wolves fear people almost as much, and they're not so fond of bears either. When a mama bear and two nearly adult cubs arrive, 
the wolves decide it's time to leave. The bears enjoy their catered meal, and that's the problem. The forest offers enough for the bears to live on, but the city's garbage provides much easier pickings. The bears would rather go out to eat. The problem will only get worse. Female bears that eat from dumpsters tend to have more cubs than bears that stick to a forest diet. But this place is a long way from the city. How far will a bear travel for a meal at the dump? Only one way to find out. A big heavy animal like a brown bear leaves a strong scent, making it easy to track. Meantime, the bears abandon the leftovers to the wolves. The next day, Andreas returns with Sita, a Hanover. She can follow a scent for miles. She and Andreas team up to track a bear. This isn't a specially big bear, but still, my hand fits into the print. It's an adult, five to ten years old. That makes a print like this. This is interesting. The bear scratched his tree. I can see lots of hairs here where he rubbed himself. The bear crossed here, did he? Sita, come. And by the way, this is Dracula's castle. After a brisk walk over the rugged, scenic Carpathians, sure enough, the trail leads Andreas and Sita back to the city of Brazov. And here we are again, back at the garbage dump. And here comes a garbage truck. The bear has traveled 25 kilometers to get here. Tonight, the forest has set a trap to capture some bears and send them further away than that. Hopefully too far away for them to make their way back. They bait their trap with honey. Much easier to find in the city than a dead deer. And bears really do like it. A small bear is coming along, and a second one behind it. Two young bears. The bears take the bait. But before the last bear gets into the cage, damn, a sheepdog is chasing the bears away. And so this time, the three bears lived happily ever after.